Welcome for you now entering another hauntingly horrific episode of What Happened, the Macabre Menagerie, where we wade deep into the dead carcasses that litter the graveyard of the that that, that that's it for the for the horror-based wordplay. It's exhausting, and I'm bad at it. And speaking of bad, Silent Hill Downpour! Now, whether it's the small foibles of Konami's long-running horror series or the slapstick-style tumblings down the staircase of failure, there's no shortage of prime cuts of trouble you can dissect and splay open for the world. They range from poor attempts at trying to diversify into other genres, to poorer adaptations into other mediums, to finally arriving at the poorest of HD remasters that pissed off the entire population of the planet. No, sir. I didn't like it. So while Downpour is not the first title that raised red flags amongst its fanbase, it is the one that caused a significant step down in stature for Silent Hill. From its development, its budget, its marketing, and its overall play within the video game industry. Hell, you, you can make the case that this is what caused the need for a franchise reboot by Hideo Kojima until that was cancelled. God damn it. I'm so tired. As it stands, Downpour is the last mainline game in the series to have ever been released. So what happened? Oh god, I'm so sad. First, let's step into the veil of one of the most somber and satanic time periods in human history, 2008. It marked the anticipated, citation needed, of Double Helix's combat-heavy and, just as equally bug-heavy, Silent Hill Homecoming, the first Western-made entry for HD consoles after the shuttering of Team Silent. That went well, so following either those mixed reviews that the California-based developer received, or the fact they were gearing up for a packed schedule of projects contracted by other third parties, Konami decided to look elsewhere for the next shepherds of their once critically lauded psychological horror series. So where would Konami turn? Maybe in the US, once again? Yeah, kinda pricey. Back to Japan? <laughs> Perish the thought. Oh, well, Climax did alright with the source material. Why not the UK? No, oh, what, what is Konami? Made out of money? See, the first Silent Hill was made on a shoestring budget, and to hopefully make a profitable new entry, they needed to look for something cheaper. And I present to you something cheaper. Ah, we found it. The mecca of up-and-coming game design, Bruno the Czech Republic. Here, we'd find one Vantra Games, a company no one ever heard of with one other project to their credit, the often, for good reason forgotten, Russian attack expatriate. So who the hell are slash were these people? None of you are asking? Well, I'll tell ya. Kuju Entertainment is a weird entity, owning a handful of smaller studios like Headstrong, Makers of Battalion Wars, House of the Dead Overkill, and most important of all, Lord of the Rings, oops, all Aragorn edition. Kuju wanted to open a Czech-based studio for a variety of reasons, and when I say a variety, I mean because it was cheap. Don't get so mad. I was just joking. A few veteran staff from another Czech-based subsidiary that 2K owned were also looking for work at the same time, so they formed Vatra Games with Kuju as their parent company. Konami, sensing immediately that they could save some money, even more immediately hired Vatra to resurrect their much loved Russian attack franchise. Wow, this is a weird play that came seemingly out of nowhere, as I can't think of a reason why they'd suddenly- oh. Anyway, Russian attack expatriate just as quickly rushed out of the minds of pretty much everyone the moment it hit digital stores, and was certainly not bolstered by all the negative reviews. Hey, Silent Hill fans, get fucking hyped for downpour! <laughs> Regardless of their inexperience, even the most doomed development cycles can be righted if you have good producers or senior people leading the project. In this case, Tom Hewlett had been appointed to a general producer for the franchise ever since it had moved away from Team Silent. Tom's track record within this role is rather spotty as he worked on such entries as Book of Memories and the HD Collection, but also more solid efforts like Origins or Shattered Memories. It's unfair to pin all blame or praise on any one singular person, so without delving too much into his history with Silent Hill, as well as the fanbase's feelings, let's just say, yeah, he had his work cut out for him. 
So let's start with one of the earliest aspects of Downpour's design, one which was a concept that Konami's producers, like Tom, had been toying with since Homecoming. This concept was that the next protagonist to venture through the fog-written town would be one with a criminal past. Up until that point, the MCs of all previous titles were everyday people. Fathers, husbands, daughters, and G.I. Joes. Murphy Pendleton, Downpour's central character, would break this mold by being an inmate accused of crime that was left somewhat intentionally hazy. Now, since most fans were aware as to what type of place Silent Hill was, the idea of an out-and-out criminal being confined within supernatural walls would be a great hook in which to entice players old and new. However, things started off rather rocky as staff within Vatra Games disagreed with this approach. In an interview with Silicon Nera, Tom recounted, Originally, when we presented this to the developer, Vatra Games, a lot of them said we don't want to play as a bad guy, we don't want to be a criminal. To me and Devin Shatsky, another producer, that seemed like a good reaction to get. We don't want people to be comfortable, even if they are okay playing as a criminal. We want them to be wondering, what is this guy about? Why is he in prison? Why is he in Silent Hill? Do I like this guy? Am I like this guy or am I not like this guy? We put some things in there to make people think about that. This pushback, however, was not only shared by the team at Vatra, but from early playtesters as well, as Hewlett explains. In some early focus tests, people were split. Some people are really into it and it doesn't bother them, but others were bothered by certain elements, so I think we're in a good spot. Hopefully, having a criminal as a protagonist brings a new depth to the series. While it's great not to be overconfident, using words such as hopefully and being happy with a divisive opinion on your product is probably not the most auspicious way to start. Just, you know, call me crazy. I'll take my chances. Despite all these protests, this still went forward as the core of Downpour's narrative, and while interesting on paper, it didn't really work out in practice for a number of reasons, more on that later. The next example of developmental headaches for the team adventure was the general scope of the game itself. As I mentioned earlier, their only previous effort was the simple level base side scroller Russian Attack, and while they both ran on the same engine, Unreal 3, Downpour was a semi-open world horror title dripping in atmospheric effects, multiple NPCs with associated side quests, and branching narrative paths and choices. Unreal 3 was also not the easiest engine in which to build an open world game in the first place on, and Downpour was no exception. Inconsistent frame rate, texture loading, collision issues, and screen tearing, while common in Unreal 3 and say a shooter, is absolutely debilitating in something like Silent Hill, as it goes a long way in destroying the atmosphere, immersion, and sense of dread it's supposed to invoke on the player. Something else that hurt the production process, but was admittedly out of Vatra and even Konami's hands, was the music. You know, probably one of the most important aspects of any Silent Hill game. Yeah, that stuff. When Downpour was first announced in 2010, Konami made it loud and clear that longtime Japanese producer and composer for the series, Akira Yamaoka, would not be returning to contribute. Now, Akira had already quit Konami right after scoring Shattered Memories in 2009, but the hope would be that he would still return to the series as an independent contractor, which obviously didn't pan out. To most fans, not having his distinctive sound would be like saying, yeah, for this new Silent Hill, there won't be any music at all, or fuck it, graphics. We're getting rid of both. This audio hellscape, this magic blend of melancholy ballads, industrial death marches, and wailing tones is what gave the series its most evocative identity, with Yamaoka being at the center of it all. He also represented the last remaining connective tissue to Team Silent, so upon this announcement, many fans wrote off Downpour from there on out. Damage Control was in full swing with this news, however, as Konami was quick to announce that the composer from Showtime's Dexter, Daniel Licht, would be providing the music in the wake of Yamaoka's departure. The design director at Vatra, one Brian Gomez, didn't exactly placate the fan outcry when he chimed in with, As much as I would have loved the honor of working with Akira, I don't feel that we're missing out by not having him. You think this is funny, don't you? 
With that said, I don't want people to get the wrong impression here. By most accounts, Daniel Licht did a very admirable job with his score, considering he had massive, creepy, rust-ridden shoes to fill. With that even more said, it can't be overstated what a blow this was to longtime series fans who felt the very soul of Silent Hill was gone and that downpour was being made as a shallow cash grab. Tom Hewlett himself, just one year prior, even said as much when the news of Akira's split with Konami was confirmed. If Akira's music isn't there, it just doesn't sound quite right, and I'm sure there are people out there who could emulate the sound and try to get it close, but there would be something missing. So, one year later after that, he started working on a game where he knew there would be something missing. The change of composer was bad enough for stands of Silent Hill, but they had no idea what was coming next. In a hilarious and unintentional follow-up to our Hayes video, our favorite new metal maestros were continually shoved into video games during the seventh generation and were back with a bang, or rather a <laughs> Now, while there had been critics to their inclusion in Free Radicals FPS, it didn't compare to the backlash when Korn was announced to be providing the title track for the newest Silent Hill. In June of 2011, Konami boasted they had scored the dreadlocked rockers, which, as you can imagine, raised the ire of fans even further as they were still recovering from the Yamaoka news. Tom Hewlett spoke up in a few interviews around this time, and for his part was not all that enthusiastic about the choice either. The reasoning behind Korn's inclusion depended on a lot of factors. We had our licensing department put feelers out. Konami had a list of musical artists they were considering, and a Korn apparently made the most sense. Tom also went into detail about how one could avoid the song. If people don't like it, they can hit start and skip it. The song is not thrown down your throat. When informed that Silent Hill fans had started a petition to get the song removed, he stated, I'm also a big Silent Hill fan, and I can pretty much guess how they are going to react to everything we do. I wasn't wrong on this one and how they react, but I think they should hopefully calm down a little bit. You know, Murphy won't be listening to Korn or Korn won't be playing over cutscene. It's, it's nothing like that. The petition, like most petitions tend to be, was ineffective, and the game shipped with the song in the title screen regardless, as well as being used in some promotional trailers. Oh, and the track was creatively titled Silent Hill, by the way. Someone got paid for that. 2011 was a notorious year for something other than corn-based puns for articles in the gaming press, as Konami had confirmed several times that Silent Hill would release that fall, landing hopefully in the horror-themed month of October. However, when October finally did roll around, and there still wasn't any word from Konami, people uh, began to wonder. Almost midway through the month, they finally announced that, yeah, the game would slip to 2012 in the uh, equally spooky month of March. No concrete reason was given for the delay, but with all the ill will that fans were harboring after the other multiple snafus, it certainly wasn't good press for the game in any event. What was worse was that this delay to March actually hurt downpour in the long run, as well as other products Konami had coming down the pipe. Again, more on that later. So, March 12th, 2012. Downpour released to a smattering of mediocre reviews, with most people finding the game a safe, middling entry at best, hampered with a variety of technical issues like we previously outlined. One other common criticism, however, was the monster design, or lack thereof. Even within the other Western main games, there was at least a few denizens of Silent Hill that stood out and invoked the series' long-standing tradition of unnerving terrors made flesh. Downpour had but a handful of antagonistic monsters that stalked Murphy throughout the city, with their most terrifying feature being their lack of variety. The Screamer, Doll, and Weeping Bat were the most common foes players would encounter, with their somewhat pedestrian designs failing to impress. Now, moving on to the main story, that gamble of having the main character being criminal, yeah, it fell flat for both reviewers and fans alike. It didn't really leave any lasting impact on the narrative, as the true nature of Murphy's crime was dependent on the choices the user made throughout the game anyhow. So why did it matter if he was an escaped convict if some of his endings put him in a favorable light anyhow? How is that any different compared to the past protagonists? 
Much like Homecoming before it, the story seemed to be just all over the place and lacked a consistent vision, especially when compared to the entries helmed by Team Silent. When taking all of this into account, it's safe to say that while not outwardly terrible, Downpour remains one of the most forgettable entries in the entire mainline franchise, and this is mostly due to a lot of poor business and marketing decisions that diluted the design as well as a heavy dose of plain old bad timing. Now, as to how that March release date affected the grander scope of the franchise, however, is its own tragedy. Konami had a one-two donkey punch in store for its fans, as the Silent Hill HD collection was unleashed onto the unsuspecting masses just one week after Downpour. If you were a fan of the franchise, what would you spend your hard-earned money on? An incredibly mediocre, technically marred western-made Silent Hill? Or a busted, inferior version of the classics? The answer, unsurprisingly, was neither, as the low reviews of both scared off a lot of series fans, and mainstream gamers were also assaulted with a variety of other releases that week. Why Konami thought that a month that saw stuff like Mass Effect 3, Ninja Gaiden 3, Street Fighter Cross Tekken, and Resident Evil Operation Raccoon City was fertile ground for two Silent Hills that needed all the help it could get is beyond anyone's imagination. Performance issues for Downpour were also heavily criticized by fans and reviewers, as well as game-breaking bugs in various side missions. However, Vatra Games and Konami were quick to spring into action when they released a patch for the game in November of that year. So that's one, four, six, six, eight months after launch. Not to be outdone, a DLC campaign for the game titled and story was also planned, but due to low sales was canceled and instead turned into a comic book and released way later in 2015 by IDW Publishing. So who made it out of the hellish mine prison that is Silent Hill? Because man, there's certainly some casualties. Vatra Games officially declared bankruptcy in September of 2012 as Konami did not re-up their contract and they were unable to procure any future projects to keep them afloat. The patch that arrived in November was the very last thing they ever worked on. To tell you the truth, I'm sorta of sorry to see you go. Akira Yamaoka is still composing a contract capacity, having mostly worked on projects over at Grasshopper, but as of right now, hasn't announced any new titles. In 2013, Tom Hewlett confirmed his departure from Konami and found his way over to Wave Forward after having positive experiences working with them on both Book of Memories and Contra 4. He has since directed Adventure Time, TMNT, and Goosebumps games. While he was thrust into the position of a Silent Hill spokesperson and producer, he received the brunt of abuse from the fanbase, often receiving death threats during his tenure. He however doesn't regret his time working there and views it as a learning experience that's been integral to his career. It's unclear if Konami has any future plans for the franchise as their last major flirtation with it ended up in a cancellation that broke the hearts of many a fan. It's definitely a touchy subject as it's also intrinsically linked to the departure of Hideo Kojima, which is a story for another day. So while Downpour was no earth-salting disaster, it seems unlikely that Konami will ever return to it. You promised you'd take me there again someday. But you never did. So yeah, if you know of any other depressing diatribes in the video game or motion picture industries, send me a creepy note in the comments below or walk into the foggy streets of the Flophouse VIP Patreon to vote on our next subject. See you next time and thanks for watching.